This is session four of Experiencing Soul Rest. We've been talking about soul rest and what it is and where we can find it. Jesus invited us to soul rest in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, where we saw it's just an invitation to come into his presence. He said, come to me and you'll find rest for your souls. Last week, I talked with you about some very simple steps that carry us into the presence of of Jesus, Bible reading and prayer were among them. Most of us approach uh, our spiritual life from the aspect of self-transformation. Therefore, when we read the Bible or pray or whatever it is that we do, uh, it's our effort to change. The problem is, it doesn't work. Peter Lord came to a very discouraging time in his ministry it didn't relate to what was going on in his church. It had to do with what was going on in his own life. In his book, Soul Care, he explains how he felt. He wrote out a letter of resignation to God saying, I believe in you and in Jesus Christ as Lord, but if there is not any more to this than I have discovered thus far, I am quitting at the end of the year. Lord was serious, and he wrote, I was overcome by evil thoughts, lust in particular. I didn't enjoy praying or find it beneficial. I studied the Bible to preach to others, not for my own needs. I didn't truly know God or know much about him, and what I did know was incorrect. I was neither experiencing nor practicing what I preached. I wasn't a deliberate Hypocrite. In fact, he said, I, I was determined not to be one, though I could not grasp the way to change. The Christian life, he said, was one constant struggle for me. It was obvious that if something significant didn't happen in my faith life, I was headed for trouble. If you are honest, you'll have to admit that you have some of those same problems. The Christian life isn't working for you. What is the problem? How does, the, how does a person become an authentic follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? How can you uh, experience the life transformation that Peter Lord so desperately wanted? This is very serious, isn't it? For that reason, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I want to show you a secret it is a secret that isn't a secret at all. It's in your Bible. It's been there all the time, but most of us miss it. I missed it for years. First, let me define what I mean by spiritual transformation. Spiritual transformation is the process of radical change. When God initiates radical change in a person's life, one of the first things he does is to force a confrontation with the deadness, with the brokenness, and with the bondage that reigns in that person's life. It simply becomes a crushing reality. Ruth Haley Barton, in her book, Sacred Rhythms, acknowledges God's work in bringing us to see our unlikeness to Christ in order to bring us to an awareness of the need for personal tr spiritual transformation. She writes, there comes a time in the spiritual life when one of the major things that God is up to is to lovingly help us see ourselves more clearly. It's usually not very pretty when that happens. You know, when a person goes shopping for a home, they don't just look at the outside of the home, they look at the inside, they look at the underside, if there is one, and they look at the foundation. Externally, everything may appear to be fine while the inside of the house is in shambles. In the church, what we usually do is to present ourselves to each other neatly dressed 
and well-groomed. Yet the Bible tells us God doesn't see as men see. Men look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So when God is ready to transform a person's life, he reveals the interior and the underbelly of that life. How will he do that in your life? Well, I can tell you that he will do that by, in the beginning, making you see the deepening spiritual sickness of your own life. And, and when you see that, he will allow you to take some steps on your own to recover. Yet in order to prove your own helplessness and powerlessness to bring about change, God often allows that condition to worsen until we become more desperate. Until then, it's easy to live on the surface of things, seeking to renovate our lives, which is what most of us do. It's really all we can ever do in our own power is some surface renovation. But that effort at renovation always fails. Ultimately, God brings us face to face with our personal need for radical change. Radical change, true spiritual transformation, takes place only in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Now, all of us are familiar, I suppose, with the concept of metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is radical change. In biology, it describes the series of developmental changes that insects go through to become adults. Consider the monarch butterfly. Uh, that butterfly passes through four stages of life. As you know, mon monarch butterflies are some of the most beautiful butterflies in the world. The monarch butterfly lays its eggs on the underside of the milkweed plant. The reason it does is because milkweed is the only uh, plant that uh, a caterpillar of a monarch butterfly will eat. So it chooses that plant uh, a few days later, a tiny caterpillar emerge, emerges, and then that tiny little caterpillar eats and eats and grows and grows until it eats the milkweed plant. And as the caterpillar grows, it sheds its skin several times uh, through this stage of life. I remind you that snakes also shed their skin, but snakes don't experience radical change. They continue to be snakes and spend all their lives crawling on their bellies. But metamorphosis is radical change. It's more than shedding skin. It's transformation from one form to another. It is change so radical as to be unrecognizable from the previous form. So as you know, the caterpillar, when it becomes full grown, it inches its way 30 to 40 feet from the plant where it was born. It attaches itself to a place where it will safely pupate. The caterpillar has been an egg. It became a caterpillar. Then it enters the chrysalis stage of metamorphosis. And when that caterpillar sheds its skin the final time, its new form is a jade green chrysalis. And inside that chrysalis, the final transformation occurs. And what emerges nine to 14 days later exhibits a transformation so distinct and so dramatic that it appears almost impossible. Did you know that long before the term metamorphosis described a biological life cycle, that it described the process of spiritual transformation? The word metamorphosis comes from a Greek word, metamorpho. It's found four times in the New Testament. The first two times the word occurs, it, it, it's in conjunction with the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. It's also found in Mark chapter 9. The term transfigured comes from the Greek word metamorpho. What the disciples saw on that mountain was a radical change in the person of Jesus. For a brief time on that mountain, those disciples caught a glimpse of who Jesus really was. 
His clothes were different. His face was different. They said that his face was shining like the sun. We can assume that the brilliance blinded them so that they weren't able to see the full extent of his transformation. Peter later would describe it as being an eyewitness of his majesty. But the second time the word appears in the New Testament, it appears in the book of Romans in chapter 12 as Paul challenges his readers with these words. He said, don't be conformed to this world. He said, I urge you, I beseech you, don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. This word transformed comes from that Greek word metamorpho. It is the call for radical change. And in that verse, it stands in contrast to that other word, the word conformed. The word conformed describes the process of conforming or molding oneself to another's pattern. This is simply shedding one skin for another. It's something accomplished by effort or by manipulation. Most of what we do as Christians is an effort to conform, and conformity is a work of the flesh. It is, it is an effort of the will to produce and maintain change. And it doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work in my life, and it doesn't work in your life. Paul says, don't try to conform. Rather, what you need to be is transformed. Paul calls for a metamorphosis, and metamorphosis is radical change. It is transformation so distinctly and dramatically different that it seems almost impossible. Now, although the New Testament doesn't use the term about the two illustrations I want to give you, we know that such a dramatic transformation took place in each case. The first case is in the life of the legion, the man who was possessed by many demons, and the change in him was so dramatic that those who knew him before found him hardly recognizable, this man who was a wild man, and now he was sitting and clothed and in his right mind. He certainly had been transformed. And the second case is found in John chapter 9. It's in the story of the man born blind. And if you'll read that story and you look at verses 8 and 9, after his encounter with Jesus, the man was so different, so radically different, that people could hardly recognize him as the same man. So these men didn't conform. They had no power to effect change in their own lives. They were transformed by the power of the Lord Jesus. Now, the final and perhaps most important time this word metamorpho is used in the New Testament is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. I want to read those verses to you, if I might. Paul writes, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. There it is, radical change. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as 
from the Lord, the Spirit. First, we need to understand what Paul was talking about that happened to Moses. You will remember that during the time that Moses spent 40 days up on Mount Sinai in the presence of God, when he came down to the people, his face was shining. He had been so close to God that there was a glow, there was a difference about him. And the Bible says his face shone when he came down the mountain. The problem was that as time passed and Moses spent time apart from God, the glory faded. Moses put the veil over his face to hide the fact that the glory faded. He wanted people to think that he still had the aura of being un in God's presence, having been in God's presence. Unfortunately, he used the veil to conceal the truth. I want to ask you a question. How many veils are in the church today? How many times have you exhausted yourself in an effort to hold up a front that makes you appear to be something you are not? Underneath the veil of thin Christian frosting is a broken person desperately trying to hide that brokenness. So what Paul does here in 2 Corinthians is he uses Moses as an example of the need for genuine spiritual transformation. In verse 18, he uses this Greek term metamorpho, where it is translated transformed. It's clear that Paul is describing a process of transformation that takes place as we focus on Christ and spend time as his presence. Just as Moses' face changed because of his time in God's presence, our lives experience radical change only by focusing on Christ and spending time with him. This is true spiritual transformation and requires no veil, but it happens only as you and I spend time in the presence of Jesus. You will remember I've talked with you about Jesus and the words that he spoke at the tomb of Lazarus that brought about radical change in his life, that brought him out of death and into life. Thankfully, he still speaks those words over the dark places of failure and pain in leaders' lives. Thus, even the dark night of spiritual exhaustion can become the place of radical change as we learn how to come into his presence and simply lay our lives at his feet. The spiritual disciplines become the means by which we shift our gaze and reset our focus on Christ. And as our focus changes, and as we become content to look on him and depend on him and trust our lives to him, we experience true spiritual transformation into his likeness. The disciplines that I've been talking to you about, simple things like Bible reading and prayer, they come to you as assignments from God. Only God can call you to read his word. That is one way he draws you into his presence. God calls you to pray. That is another way he draws you into his presence. He may call you to fast or to a season of solitude in order to call you into his presence. He calls you to some spiritual discipline to bring you into his presence. The discipline God chooses for you might not be the discipline you choose for yourself. In his book, Shaped by the Word, Robert Mulholland suggests that God chooses the discipline that fits our brokenness and warns that that discipline may not be easy or comfortable. You see, spiritual transformation doesn't happen as the result of a New Year's resolution. Life change doesn't occur by a decision of the will, not yours or mine. That's why any positive thinking method posed as true spirituality is so dangerous. Joel Osteen is a prime example. It leads people to believe that by the force of their own thoughts and will, they have the power to change. Richard Foster, in his book, 
the celebration of discipline explains. The moment we feel we can succeed and attain victory over sin by the strength of our will alone is the moment we are worshiping the will. Willpower will never succeed with dealing with the habits of ingrained sin. Will worship may produce an outward show of success for a time, but in the cracks and crevices of our lives, our deep inner condition will eventually be revealed. The mud will come seeping through. Dallas Willard joins Foster in extending the following warning. He says, As abundant experience teaches us to strive to merely act in conformity with Jesus' expressions of what living in the kingdom of God is like, is to attempt the impossible. We may work hard at it and keep up a good front for a while, but eventually we'll all fall flat on our faces. If everybody in the church was honest, the pastor, the deacons, the staff, they would tell you they've fallen on their faces more times than they care to remember. But Jesus doesn't want us on our faces, and he certainly doesn't want us wearing a veil to hide the truth about who we are or who we are not. True spiritual transformation occurs at the feet of Jesus as we look to him in humble dependence and total surrender. Moses didn't assume God's glory by the force of personal effort. He acquired that change in his life, that glow on his face, by spending time in God's presence. And when it first happened, he didn't even realize it. He didn't even recognize it. Until we learn the secret of spending time in the presence of our Lord, we're going to weary ourselves holding up a veil to hide the truth about who we're not. We will leave our worship gatherings the same as we entered and constantly wonder why there's so little difference between us and the world. Not too many weeks ago, I had a conversation with a young minister from another denomination. He came to pick my older brain about some questions he had in regard to the spiritual life. So as he talked, I tried to listen more than talking myself until he said, I know that we are to mimic the life of Christ. And when he said that, I interrupted. I said, there is the problem. We were never intended to mimic Christ. Christ intended to live in us and to live his life through our own. We can't produce the Christian life by force of our own effort. Only through the surrender of our lives to Christ can we ever be what he intended us to be. There's a hymn in our hymnal that we used to sing. It asks a question. Have you failed in the plan of your storm-tossed life? Put your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Are you weary and worn from its uh, toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Could Peter walk on water? No. Did Peter walk on water? Yes, he did. How? By looking to Jesus. Did Peter sink? Yes. Why did he sink? Well, he took his eyes off Jesus. Did Peter, sinking, cry out for the Lord's help? Yes. What happened? Well, the Lord grabbed him by the hand, pulled him up out of the water, and carried him back to the boat. You see, Peter was safe only in the arms of Jesus, and so are you. Are you sinking? Have you experienced spiritual failure? You can't do it, can you? No, you can't. All you can hope to do is to place yourself at Jesus' feet and ask Him to carry you, to save you, and to keep you at His feet and in His presence. We experience true spiritual transformation. That place alone is the place of radical change. I hope that you will allow the Lord to do what only He can do in your life. Tell Him about your failures. Say, Lord, I can't do this. I can't handle it. I can't walk on water. Please, Lord, pick me up and carry me. 
That's the only way I'll ever make it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.